as we were looking at this week and uh, everything that has taken place over the last few weeks. And we have been studying in the, Pro in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, over the last couple weeks here in church. And um, I decided to go ahead and go with that um, again this week because this section of Proverbs, chapter 4, is a mini capsule of the Bible itself. It tells us what God would have us to do. It talks about the paths that we can take, and we are definitely on a path. We as a culture, we as a country, and we as a church are on paths. And sometimes those paths that we are on are very difficult. Sometimes we do not know what's around the next corner, and sometimes we get very confused, sometimes very lonely. Sometimes we are so overwhelmed with what we think we should do that we just get stressed, overwhelmed. We get to the point that we are saying, what in the world is next? So as the body of Christ, as the church, what do we do when we get into a situation where what is next for us? What is next for my personal life? Well, I don't even know what to do. Everything about me, everything I believe on is being fought. What do I do? And we look at the Word of God, and, and there's a phrase that many of you know, many of you probably have never heard this. It's called the Christian worldview. The Christian worldview. And you're saying, what in the world is the Christian worldview? The Christian worldview is exactly what this church stands on. Everything that we do, everything that we say, every action that we perform must be baptized into God's Word. We believe as a Christian worldview church that the world's hope is in Jesus Christ. The church's future has to be built on Jesus Christ. Every decision that is made must be baptized by God's Word. When somebody says, how can I join your church? How can, how can I become a member of Glenville? I'll tell them, you must have a Christian worldview. In other words, you must believe that the word of God is truth. You have to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. You have to believe that the world, hope, is in Christ. We're not coming to church and join a church for the music, for the preaching, and for the potluck suppers. We're coming to a church, and we're going to join a church because the church is the hope to the next generation. We have to be willing to stand in adversity, to understand the path that I am taking is for the right cause, even if it faces adversity. Can we stand knowing that Jesus Christ is the purpose, and it is the reason? When did the church ever think that the hope of the world is in its government? When did we ever think that people are going to get saved because the government commands it? You know how people are going to get saved? is when the body of Christ proclaims the message of Jesus Christ unashamedly. Amen. We must understand it is the local, visible body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his expression, reflection, and extension to a broken world. If we are not that extension, if we are not Jesus Christ's hands, eyes, and feet, we are playing church. In our society today, the church is of no effect. Why? It's because we enjoy church. Tired of enjoying church. I was talking to one of our deacons. Last night he was driving by and we stopped and we talked. And he said, he said, what are you going to do tomorrow? I said, well, I'm going to preach. And he goes, he goes, do me a favor. He said, step on my toes. Today, when we're talking, our church needs to be like a, a mission. We have to transplant Glenville Baptist Church into a foreign country that is not a Christian nation. And we must go into that country knowing that we must communicate the love and the forgiveness of Christ to a country, a culture, and a city that does not believe what we believe, 
that we are not the main topic. Christianity is foreign to them. We are aliens of this world. What we must do is we must treat Wichita, Kansas, Hayesville, Derby as a culture that is not Christian, that does not believe the way you believe. We must stand up and be able to articulate a worldview to people that definitely is against your view. Oh, we can talk to somebody. We can go to church with somebody. We can enjoy church as long as they're agreeable with us, as long as they'll say amen, as long as they don't argue, as long as they understand what you understand. We're happy with each other. But what about if our country becomes a non-Christian country, what will happen to our churches? What will happen if your tax donations get taken away? What happens if our tax-free status is gone? Do we still love Christ? Will we still go to church? We're on a path, and that path is going to intersect with reality. And what we must do is we have to understand, is my faith strong enough to endure? Do I know what path I am on? And Solomon is talking to his son, and he says, son, I am giving you some wisdom. There's going to be a day where this wisdom and this understanding that I'm going to give to you must be put into practice. There's going to be a day where it's not going to be easy. There's going to be a day where adversity is going to come, problems will arise, and people will be against you. What do you do? What do you do? In our culture sometimes, easy believism is the name of the game. I can go to church, I can sit in a pew, and I can raise my hand, and I can say a sinner's prayer. And the pastor gets up and says, we have 15 people saved today because 15 people were under conviction or emotion about they are needing Jesus Christ. But when they walk out the doors, there's no change in their life. There's no power of God within their life. And they have false sense of security that they have given their life to Christ when actually all they did was, was emotional and they said a prayer. I believe our churches are full of people that have said a few words in the air that may have even come down to the altar, but their faith has not changed paths. Their life has not been altered. And now when, confront, when you have to confront an issue of life that is so delicate and so important, what we, the church, sometimes does is we stick our head in the sand. We turn our heads and say it will never affect us. Well, guess what? Life is going to affect us. If Jesus Christ didn't change your destination, if he didn't change your path, you're still on the wrong path. You can say what you want. You can come to church and you can sing whatever you want to sing. You can sing. You can preach. You can read out of any version of the Bible you want to. What changes us the Holy Spirit living within us. And if we have the power of God and we are led by the Holy Spirit of God, we will instantaneously want to decide, I will fight for the cause of Jesus Christ. I believe that I have been forgiven. And when I am forgiven, I will stand for that forgiveness. I will honor God in that forgiveness. I will treat others as if they needed that same forgiveness. And I, I totally agree with a lot of things that were said over the last couple days. I totally disagree on how it was said over the last couple days. I truly believe if we are the ointment of God and the Holy Spirit of God within this church and within this country, our job is to communicate grace and love and forgiveness. And if they will never see Christ, they may never see Christ because Christ is embodied in the church. And if the Christ is not embodied in the church, and we are no longer going out into a culture that needs Jesus Christ, what we're saying to them is, we don't care. We must have to get into our path and be wise in understanding and be strong enough to engage and love enough to stand with grace, love, and truth because it may be their topic today it may be your topic tomorrow 
We may not be talking about your sin today. But what if I'm hitting on your sin? What if somebody's confronting you about your sin? Oh, we can hide in the sand and act like it doesn't take place. You know, in Scripture, when God puts Scripture in place, he puts sexual immorality along with disobedient to parents, to gossip, to liars, to cheats, and to murderers. It's thrown all over the place. It is not saying, this sin is so bad. You know what God says? Sin is when I have given you a commandment, and sin is when you miss the mark of God's word and you fall short, it is sin. Oh, this sin is much worse than this sin. Al cheating on the golf course is just as bad as any other sin. Sin is sin. We have to be forgiven of our sin. To believers, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. But I don't like that one. I don't like that sin. What we must do is we must get on the right path. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 4. And I spent 10 minutes on my introduction. I haven't even gotten to the scripture yet. So I want to read this and then I'll dissect it. Now, don't even look at your notes. You probably won't ever get to them anyway. So it says, Hear my son and receive my sayings that, there, that the years of your life will be many. I have taught you in the way of wisdom and I have led you in the right paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered and when you run, you will not stumble. Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her for she is your life. Do not enter into the paths of the wicked and do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on. For they do not sleep until they have done evil. For their sleep is taken away unless they make someone fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is like the shining sun, the shine even brighter until the perfect day. And the way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. What is wisdom? I believe God's word is wisdom. The quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. The quality of being wise. A wise one. When somebody says, that was a wise decision. That was very wise. They're saying you used the information and God gave to you the intellect and you made the proper choice. You chose wisely. And sometimes that wisdom, sometimes we feel is very fleeting. Sometimes we can be very wise in this choice and very foolish in the very next choice. The accusation of wisdom can be stressed repeatedly and repeatedly. But that same wise people that same wise person in the last four or five decisions when they are confronted with a very simple decision sometimes chooses unwisely. Because sometimes we try to choose with our own understanding, with our own abilities, and we don't baptize our choices with God's word. Last week we talked about Proverbs chapter 4, verse 5. It says, get wisdom, but getting everything, get understanding. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. If we do not have wisdom, we will not make it. I like what it said here in that very first um, verse. It says, Hear, my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of your life will be many. I have taught you the ways of wisdom. In other words, I have communicated it. I have shared it with you. I talked to you the scriptures. I shared with you the scriptures. We have communicated morning, day, and night about what the scripture says. And then it says, and I have led you in the right paths. I have not only communicated, but I have led you. I have shown you. I have given you an example to follow. There are two paths, and these two paths are very different. The first path is the path of wisdom. Verse 411, I have taught you in the way of wisdom. And it benefits, there are benefits in choosing this path. The years of your life will be long. The things that we do within our life are so important. 
And the choices that we make are so important. We have seen calamity. We've seen young people given, um, making stupid decisions and things take place because of unwise decisions. They do some crazy things and, you know, they may be a child of God. But just because you're a child of God does not mean that we make wise choices. We have to stay on that path and we have to understand that path can give to us blessings. I like what it said in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace, they will be added to you. Length of days and long life, that's one thing. But peace? Oh, the thing that we need is peace. The thing that we strive for is understanding that I need to have God's peace. And then the path of the wicked. The path of the wicked. We have the path of the wise, and then we have the path of the wicked. The path of the wicked, the contrast is, am I going to have a wise life, or am I going to follow after the wicked? The consequences are due. You may have some blessings if you choose the wise path, but when we do choose the wicked or the folly, what happens is there are some consequences. And he he warns us in this in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 14. Do not enter into the path of the wicked. Do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on by it. Solomon's talking to his son, and you you could hear this. His son, we could use this parallel here. His son is going on that. He he, he got his first car, and he's he's driving by himself for that very first time. And and he says, Dad, I'm going to be out till 12 o'clock in the morning. And and Dad is kind of nervous about it. And and he he said, Son, let me talk to you for a second. There are opportunities for you to make some very foolish decisions tonight. And I want to really give you some strong wisdom. And he says in this verse, he says, do not enter into the path of the wicked. In other words, he's saying, be very careful who you hang with, what you do. Because how it starts can end very badly. Do not walk in the way of evil. Just because other people are doing it, that doesn't mean you have to do it. If you know that they're going against what you need to do or what I have taught you or the instructions of God's word, do not walk in the way of evil. If you have a worldview, don't follow after somebody that is breaking God's word. Avoid it. Do not travel on to it. Stay away from it. Turn away from it and pass on. That is a wicked view. If somebody is trying to get you to do things that are against your word, against the worldview, against God, we need to leave it alone. So what happens on this path? We can easily become obsessed. If we have an obsessive nature, it's very easy to become obsessed with sin. And when we're obsessed with sin, things continue to go away. He says this, in verse 16, for they do not sleep unless they have done evil. In other words, they're going to stay up. They're going to do whatever they want to do. And their sleep is taken away unless they make someone fall. Sometimes we become obsessed of doing evil. Sometimes when we start falling, we don't stop. Sometimes the addictions within our life become so overwhelming. And those addictions that we have within our life start to compel us to try, to do, to keep, and that compels us just to hide it and to stay away from anybody that will open up and to communicate. And in John chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of it. Whoever commits sin is a slave to it. How's that? If we do not confess our sins, if we are not faithful to God and broken about our sins, we become a slave to that sin. And any time that we are a slave to a sin, that, 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 that sin has captured us to a point that we cannot break that addiction, we cannot break that sin, that sin becomes so overwhelming, that sin becomes so important to us, everything else matters nothing except for that addiction or to that sin. 
what we must do is we must stay away from the path of the wicked. So the two paths are contrasted. So how are we contrasting these two paths? Um, I think it's very important um, when we look at the contrast. The path of the just is like the shining sun. The path of the, of the just is like a shining sun. But the path is just is like a shining sun that shines ever brighter unto that perfect day. When we look at the, brighty, the brightness of the sun, we are a reflection of the sun. We are like a moon that in itself is a reflection of the sun. When we come to church, when I communicate, what we have is not this is what Bruce thinks or this is even what you think. We are ambassadors for Jesus. I can't say, well, I don't like this scripture. I don't care what he says about this. Let me tell you what I think, because my word is more important than God's word. I can't say that. An ambassador has no right to speak for himself. We are ambassadors unto Christ. Our job as believers is to be a reflection of Christ. Get brighter and brighter as we live, as we mature, we can become like Christ. We can see things as Christ. What we must do is understand the way of the wicked is like the darkness. The way of the wicked is like darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. When we don't know what's going on, and we are becoming a shining light because we're like Christ, those that are of wickedness, they're in darkness. Satan has blinded the eyes of those that do not know him, and they are blind to spiritual truth. We, the body of Christ, when we have given our life to Christ, the Holy Spirit is coming into our hearts, and he has enlightened us, and the Holy Spirit gives us insight, and we can see the things of God. We have the power to live for God. But those that are wicked, those that have never given their life to Christ, they are in darkness, and they stumble. And they fail. Sometimes even in ignorance. Sometimes they believe in their own lies and they believe what they want to believe and they think what they want is more important than what anybody else wants. But see, the other side of that coin is we know the truth. We have the word of God. What do we do with the truth well, if we're going to be a, a shining light, if we are going to be the, the ambassador for Christ, we must do something. We must be on that right path. The metaphor of a progressive brightness. Let's look at that. But the path of the just is like a shining light that shines even brighter until that perfect day. Even brighter. In the midst of wickedness. In the midst of a dark world, in the midst of something that we're afraid of, what we must do is we must say, Lord, I need to be your reflection. I need to grow brighter. A metaphor of the shining sun. I need to be like Christ. This is the path of the just, of the progressive brightness of saying, saying I want to be able in darkness to be that light. We need to move our church into a position where it is a cultural, relevant church where we preach Jesus Christ, where we say that Jesus Christ can change people's lives. We can engage them, help them, and love them, but we will not condone the sin. But we have to love the sinner. We have to remember that. Because let me tell you, such were some of you me. I wish I could hide my past and say, you know what? I was a perfect young man. My parents never got, never, I never got in trouble. But you know what? There was a day that God got a hold of my heart and broke me. And I confessed my sin before him. And he forgave me of my sin. And he gave me a place called heaven as my final destination. That is why I worship the Lord. That is why I become a preacher. Because I got broken in my path and he saved me. And I have to remember when I see any person in any failure, in any addiction, or in any sin, such 
was I. I can love them. I can help them. I can encourage them. The first place they need to get to is Jesus. Because their life cannot be transformed until they see Christ. The church will not be alive until we show Christ. But that shining light needs to be compared to the Christian life. It is to be a life of progression. We begin as babes and we design to grow. Just like our Christian life. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 2, As new babies desire the pure milk of the word, that they may grow thereby. We desire something very easy. Milk of the word. But as we grow, as we mature in Christ, we must know the word of God. When somebody talks to us, when somebody asks us questions, what do you believe about a topic? What does the Bible say about the topic? You have to tell them. They may not agree with you, they may laugh at you, and they may scoff you. But if we are ambassadors of Christ, and they didn't say what is your opinion about topic, because we really don't have an opinion. If we are ambassadors to Christ, you say, well, you know what, I really don't know the whole topic, but let me tell you what the Word of God says. They may laugh at you, may scoff at you, but what you're doing is you're being relevant because God's word in the worldview is truth. And if we give out truth, they will seek truth. So, making life with Christ progressively brighter. Jesus is our light. Jesus is our light. We can't do anything without him. And when we draw nearer to the light, we have more power. When we get nearer to Christ, he starts moving within our life. If we don't get close to him, we fail. See, these paths that we're on, they're colliding. They're colliding at a fast rate of speed. We are on this path, and this path that we are supposed to be bright we are supposed to be that shining light into a dark world. We have choices to make. We have decisions to make. Those choices are, do we truly believe God can do great things through us? Or do we believe, you know what? I'm good. Everything's fine. I'll be okay. I gave my life to Christ. When I die, I'm going to heaven. And I am protected by the grace and the love of God. Or could it be? Could it be that God says, I have a plan for you? See, Jesus even talked about two paths. And he talked about two paths in Matthew chapter 7 that changes the destination and the power of our life. He says this, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate that broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there will be many who go through it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who will find it. Believers, we are the minority. Easily stated, in our culture today, we are the minority. Few will find it. But he does say something to us. Which path will you take? In Ephesians chapter five, for you were once in darkness, but now you are the light of the world. Walk as children of light. You were once in darkness, but now you've been changed. Now you're on a different path. So he says this to us in the scripture today. If you're on this right path, this is what he wants us to do. Then, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and seek my face, and turn from their wicked way. I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sins. And I will restore their land. We're not going to change the United States of America. We're not going to change Wichita. We're not even going to change this church. Unless we first get on our face before God. And say God we. The shining light. Your ambassadors to Wichita. We need you. 
They need to hear our prayers. But before we get on our knees and we ask God to change them, he says, if then my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek his face. Humble themselves. The Bible says, examine ourselves. To be humbled before God means God is standing as an almighty, all righteous, holy God. And he sees you, not the outward appearance, but he sees deep into the heart of the individual. And if we as the body of Christ, if the church around America will say, we want God to move in a mighty way, what we must do is we must not pick fights with them. We have to investigate our heart before God. And if we confess, humble, and ask God to forgive me as an individual, forgive my sin, humble myself, and seek God's face as a pure, undefiled child of God that he can look down and say, Son, I hear your prayer. I forgive your sin. It moves the very heart of God when people humble themselves. They're honest before God. He says, if they humble themselves, the body of Christ, and seek my face and call upon my name, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. The church, I believe it's our responsibility. I believe it's our fault. Because we have been asleep at the wheel. We can point fingers. I look at a Facebook over the last couple, three days. I'm embarrassed to be a pastor sometimes. People, the hatred, the meanness, the animosity. Instead of saying, I may not agree with your position, but let me tell you, I'll be praying for you, and I love you. If we, the body of Christ, such or some of you, just like their sin, we have to confess our sin. And if we can be humbled before God, God can change everything if we allow him. For an invitation today, I'm going to have, I'm going to ask our deacons and our staff to make their way across the front here. And what we'd like to do today is we'd like to call our church, the body of Christ, to prayer. Not only praying for our country, not only praying for others, but seeking God's face for ourselves. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. We need to first ask God to heal us, forgive us, and then, Lord, I need to have help. I need guidance within my life. I need our church. I need our country. I need God's power. We are the bright, shining light. The ambassadors of Christ. Are we? Are we? The only way that we're an ambassador for Christ is if we speak for Christ. If we live for Christ. Everything that we do, everything that we say, they have ramifications what we must do is humble ourselves, seek God's face, turn from our wicked ways, and see what God can do with you, through you, and for you. Humble. Don't be ashamed. The day that you gave your life to Jesus Christ, he came in and took residence within your life, and you are supposed to be a new creature on a new path, doing things for God and God alone. So what can we do today? Ask God to heal us. Ask God to help us. Ask God to energize us. Ask God to do things through us that cannot be done on our own. We cannot win in the flesh. The only way that you, the church, and the world will win is when God intervenes. God has the power. God is the power. He is using us as a vehicle in order to unleash what God wants. No, stick our head in the sand. Don't say somebody else can do it. Another church can do it. No, we are the body of Christ. It is our responsibility to get up, humble ourselves, and engage through God's word.
and through God's power. Would you please stand with me? I'm going to have a word of prayer. We're going to play some music in the background, and we're just going to spend some time in prayer. If you want one of the staff guys or, or uh, one of the wives to pray with you, uh, if you just want to come down here at the altar, you feel free to do that. But we want God's hand to be upon this service. Dear Father, bless us. Hear our hearts. Put us on the right path. Lord, if we, if we do what you called us to do, and we proclaim the message of Jesus Christ high and lifted up, I pray that we will give our hearts to you. Lord, today, if somebody is here that is not on that right path, they have never given their life to Christ, they are hurting, they're struggling, and they need that relationship with you, I pray that you will allow them to talk to one of these men. Allow us to give to you the very gift of salvation. But Lord, give us the challenge to change. Hear our hearts. Hear our prayers. Listen to the church that has been saved, sanctified, and brought through the fire to call you Lord and to forgive everything that we have done. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. Let's spend some time in prayer as a church.